now that our asses are at home, now that we're not working, I want to keep you guys educated, but also entertained. So we're going to talk uh, all things coronavirus, your health, uh, hopes, dreams, your overall life, what you can expect for life after coronavirus. And we're going to do it in a really entertaining way with my celebrity friends, guests, uh, actors, and musicians. And in this guy, in this case, a uh, famous thought leader. So we want to do it in an entertaining way now that you guys are sitting your butts at home, keeping everybody safe. With that, I'd love to introduce my guest today. All right, Mr. Walter O'Brien, also known as Scorpion, is the founder of scorpioncomputerservices.com. And he's a global think tank for hire that provides intelligence on demand as a concierge service for any funded need. Walter is the executive producer of this hit CBS TV drama, Scorpion which just wrapped up its fourth season, inspired by his life with over 26 million viewers in the US and airs to 188 countries, up to a billion viewers a week. Walter was diagnosed as a high IQ child prodigy with an IQ of 197. He was certified by the US Department of Homeland Security as being of national interest to the United States and granted him an extraordinary abilities visa. Who knew there was a, such a thing? Walter has mitigated risk for seven years on $1.9 trillion of investments and has invented and applied artificial intelligence engines to protect U.S. warfighters in Afghanistan. Walter has personally applied artificial intelligence to the Navy's command and control system Agile, as well as Aegis, the ballistic missile defense system, and recently deployed his AI engine Sengen to the U.S. Army's drone fleet. So not as the amazing, he's also helping to protect our forces, guys. Walter has created over 150 unique technology inventions, uh, is an Irish national coding champion and competed in the Olympics in informatics. Every, uh, Walter has given the keynote sp speaker at Mensa's annual gathering, has won C-Suite Quarterly Visionaries Award and provided the seed funding for Taxi Watch, a suicide prevention program that has saved over 130 lives to date, which we know is a major issue uh in today's times so it's my great honor and privilege to introduce my good friend mr walter o'brien thanks thank you for having me appreciate you taking the time i love it how your name came up as scorpion you entered scorpion huh <laughs> is that what your friends call you scorpion depends on which friends but yeah scorpion is my <laughs> hacker uh my hacker handle so depends on how people met me i'm many things to many people that's super cool. That's super cool. So I'm telling, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing from the accent there, you're Irish national, you're from Ireland. I thought I'd eliminated most of my accent, but yes, born and raised in Ireland, educated in England and uh, been over in Los Angeles for about 20 years. Tell me about Walter Scott when you were young. What, what were you like as a little lad? If we were friends when you were, let's say 12 years old. Uh, 12, I was, um, most of the time programming and playing with my computer, uh, learning to hack, learning to code, self-taught. Uh, uh, so if we were friends, I would have been very geeky and not spending a whole lot of time on sports. How um, old you when you were identified gifted? Nine when I was first identified gifted, 13 when I hacked NASA and, and I got remeasured. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, that's that's when they, around then was when they started explaining what was wrong with me. Oh. Uh, why I asked too many questions at school. So how did that, the hacking NASA, NASA come about? Um, curiosity. Back then, technology, computers didn't really have much graphics or images or animation. Mm -hmm. So I was just on the ARPANET, which is kind of like it was before the internet. Um, it was primarily a government network. And I came across a DWG file, which is an AutoCAD file. And it was two megabytes, which is nothing today. But back then, that was mm -hmm. huge. Yeah, I was like, wow, that must be a pretty cool drawing. Must be a lot of complexity in it. Um, so I wanted to see it, and I didn't know what it was so based on the file name. So I started downloading it, and I got I was on a dial-up modem that was super slow, and I got cut off ten minutes in, and I thought it was just bad phone lines in Ireland, wind blowing on the line or whatever. But then when I went back in, I got cut off ten minutes later as well. So I was like, that's weird. So I realized it was. Uh, systems monitoring what it was doing and it cutting me off after a certain amount of time or bandwidth. Huh. So if you've ever tried telling a 13 year old they can't have something, they get kind of persistent. So four days later of 
recoding and pulling pieces and remembering where I got cut off and picking up where I left off and pulling down the next piece. Yeah. And a torrent and a denial of service attack. Um, I managed to assemble it. And when I opened on my computer, it was the wireframe uh, drawings to the space shuttle. Oh, how cool is that? So I printed on a big printer and stuck it in my bedroom wall like anyone would. And what, did you get a knock a few days later on the door? Or how long did that take for them to discover what you were doing? About 30 days later. And um, um, yeah, then I came home from school and house was sort of my cars. And, uh, really? Yeah, and we had a conversation. Uh, but I was somewhat prepared for it. I, I had noticed that I shouldn't have had what I had. So I uh, took some steps to prepare. Oh my gosh. But we did, we did a deal and I've done government work ever since. How funny. So are you one of these kids who went to college when were you were really young? When did you get your CSAI and, and how did that all come about? Because you're an expert in artificial intelligence, right? Yeah, my degrees are computer science and artificial intelligence degrees from Sussex University in the UK, which is one of the only universities at the time to offer a combo degree like that. Um, I tried to go to university early. I, I, um, I did correspondence courses for psychology. I also passed an, an, um, an admittance test um, to get into business and accounting training college, but I kept getting rejected when they found out I was under 16. Uh -huh. so, um, I had to go to college at normal age. I went at 18 and then got, got my double degree in three years while I was doing national championships and Olympics programming and running the company and contracting with Oracle. So I didn't, didn't sleep much back then. So what uh, is it that your company does exactly? So it's grown over the years. So we're divided now into 30% of it is government and military work. So intelligence work, satellite surveillance, anti-terrorism, uh, correlating data. A lot of it is eliminating human risk uh, in systems, making sure systems never go down, never get hacked, never have single points of failure, kind of like the plumbing of large systems. And a lot of our military depend on software and mm -hmm. trying to make old software run faster if we don't have time to rewrite it. So that's one piece. Next 30% is doing the same thing for the Fortune 1000, our smart grid, our banking system for cybersecurity, uh, expert witness work, uh, private investigations, digital forensics, um, all kinds of en what we call enterprise software work. Architect mm -hmm. Architecting big e-commerce platforms, it would be like Amazon, where they would lose millions of dollars per hour or minute if they were down. And then uh, our credit card companies. And then um, the other 30% is a business we started a little over 10 years ago now called Concierge Up. Until then, our company basically said, we'll solve any technical problem. And then our customers started asking us just to solve any problem, even if it wasn't technical. <laughs> and um, we resisted initially because my bias and training is technical. It's my comfort zone. But I went outside my comfort zone. I went, well, we have a process for solving problems. We have smart people. We have uh, you know legal and billing mechanism in place, and we have a hell of a Rolodex. There's almost nobody we can't call now on the planet and get a return call. Wow. So when you bring all that to bear, we can actually nine out of 10 times solve any problem, whether it's choosing a winning racehorse based on its DNA, speeding up the opening of a casino and doing its anti-fraud and facial recognition, um, solving an issue where mo someone's mom has throat cancer and she doesn't want to have her jaw removed, um, to cleaning up the cannabis industry when it became legalized and uh, they then they don't know how to run a legit company in terms of HR and non-disclosures and security and tracking and RFID codes and inventory and stuff that every other company would do, but it's just in that industry, they don't work that way. And then last 10% is we had to create the TV show as a recruiting mechanism to recruit other geniuses into the company. Yeah. We got the producers of Transformers, Spider-Man, Star Trek, director of Fast and the Furious, and the writers of Sopranos, Prison Break, and Hostages, put them all together and created what became a number one TV show for about four years globally. And, and it was based on my life story, Scorpion on CBS. So that once we created that, the writers and directors and producers who worked on that started working on other shows like Spider-Man Homecoming or Spider-Man Venom or other shows that uh, uh, famous actors have been in. And they started calling me saying, you know, can you 
tell us a cool gadget or how do you see through walls or how can we make a vehicle invisible or if we were going to do an Ocean's Eleven type movie but based on cryptocurrency offshore, you know, what would be the language we would use to cheat the system? And it became this thing where they, they would start writing in the script AW, which meant Ask Walter. <laughs> it was quicker to get on a call with me for 10 minutes than to spend um, three months researching this with a bunch of writers. Yeah. So we opened up Scorpion Studios. And you'll see all those movies I mentioned, you'll see me credited in them on, in the movie and IMDb because we became the tech advisors for them oh. and a whole lot more, breaking the stories. We're working on ones now that we're supposed to shoot in the spring, but with the coronavirus, we'll see when we're allowed to shoot. But yeah. we're working on the scripts now. And uh, do you all, you all, when, when we when we saw each other at Secret Knock, you also um, take care of some personal business for people who want problems solved too. It's kind of like Ray Donovan almost. Is there a story you'd like to share with us that you are allowed to share that kind of would be interesting, like a problem you've solved for a high-end client? Well, sure. Uh, so that's the business, concierge.up.com. Simplest way we describe it is if you want to search something, type it in Google. If you want it to happen, type it in concierge up. <laughs> so you know, one billionaire typed in that he wanted his son was dating a Ukrainian gold digger and he wanted us to break him up before the marriage, but don't let him know that he interfered. So it's a mixture of psychological operations, like you'd get with the CIA. Um, some engineering work, some intelligence work where he makes a new fake friend who drives the same car and clubs in the same places and wears the same clothes and lives close by. That's the, the sun. And then she makes a fake friend because we set him up at the same gym and at the same Starbucks and everything else. And they make new fake friends that they don't know are agents for us. Oh my gosh. And we learn about them over time and we make sure they're not really in love. And she was, she was actually just going to marry him threaten to embarrass the family, get a big settlement and a divorce, use the marriage to get a green card, and then use the money to bring a real boyfriend over from the Ukraine. So as soon as we knew that and heard that, we knew, because we only do things that are good or neutral for the planet. So as soon as we knew that it wasn't a real relationship, then, they, as they say in the office, she fell on the wrong side of my fairness algorithm. <laughs> so, uh, at that point, all bets were off. So. Yeah, we managed to teach the father at the right time through a psychologist and an acting coach to deliver a speech to the son that was exactly everything you shouldn't say to the son. Uh -huh. calling him. So it pissed him off enough to go to his new friend's house and like pack a bag of leave. And the new friend said, that's terrible. I don't know how you're going to get revenge on your dad, you know, power of suggestion. And it said, you're welcome to stay here, but I have to fly tomorrow to the Dominican Republic. I have a private plane flying out before my friends get married. So it took a minute for the light bulb to turn on. So then the son said, let me grab my girlfriend and go with you and we'll get married after your friend gets married. So they went out together and, and with no prenup just to punish his dad. So they went out together and first marriage happened and all the audience were there. And then they asked the audience to stay while well, the second guy went up with the Ukrainian girl and they got married. And got the marriage certificate and everything else. And she submitted it while they were on the honeymoon to start her green card processing. And um, then we let that run for a while, kept some monitoring on it. And then we, as soon as her paperwork was coming, uh, she told him she wants a divorce and she wants a huge settlement and a whole bunch of other things. So we, he, she got sent to our offices and we sat her down and she didn't know who I was, but I pres she was looking for her settlement. I gave her a contract. She flicked to the last page. She said, this is an acting contract. And I said, you recognize the signature. And it was the priest who married him in the Dominican Republic. The first wedding was fake. The audience were extras. All the, ex all the people in the Starbucks where she met the girl were extras. That's how we filled all the tables except the one where they sat together. And then, um, so the priest was fake and so was the marriage certificate. So the next letter she got was Homeland Security banning her from the U.S. for 10 years for immigration fraud. Bags packed in an Uber outside to take her to the airport. Uh, she's under a gag order and we had a letter in her handwriting as a Dear John letter saying she didn't want anything. Uh, she signed to go back to the son who's now rebonding with the father who never interfered. It sounds like a major TV movie, but you really did it. 
Well, we were doing this for 30 years before we had the TV show. So uh, the TV show retells a lot of the stories and has a lot of the characters that really work at the company today. So people who are huge fans of the show hire us by going to conciergeup.com and typing in any problem they have over 10 grand, we will put a team on it to figure it out. Like any problem, ex-wives, ex-girlfriends, business partners, grow my business, manufacture my product in China, you know, uh, take over my dad's factory and modernize it, whatever, anything at all. And then um, we will work with you, talk to you every week and solve the problem. If you're an entrepreneur, basically you can't get enough time in the day. So this allowed you to buy time. All the stuff that's not your strengths. If you're, if you're a right brain dominant and you're creative and emotional and good with people, then you can't also be left brain dominant. So your ability to do business continuity, disaster recovery, regulatory controls, your IT systems, your backups, all of that so no one can hold you to ransom or make sure you can work from home when disaster hits like we have now. All of those things, um, we take care of being left brain dominant so, you, so that it doesn't bite you in the ass and cause you to go bankrupt later. So for a lot of our customers, we do all the boring stuff they hate to do, and they yeah. do all the emotional stuff they love to do. And it allows their business to not be kind of half-assed then in terms of liability. So how much of Scorpion is true to life? We get asked that all the time. So I went back through some of the, at least the first season scripts, and like the dialogues and the jokes and the, and the things we did, and it's about 70% accurate. I mean, there's there's some emotion and car chases and and, and like gun gunplay, and I only do that on weekends. But, <laughs> but um, yeah, no, it's, it's it's very much true. But legally, we, we have to change the names, the, yeah. the characters, like change what city it happened in. But our super fans have looked at all the press on our site for like if we help catch the Boston bombers or anything like that, and they match it up with which episode had a similar event. Yeah. Um, We've done a lot of really cool stuff, and hopefully we'll have time to catch into that. We've got over 600 people watching on Facebook as well as YouTube. So I'd like to take this and kind of uh, get back to our topic about COVID-19 and the coronavirus and see um, it's a couple of quick questions. You know, there's a lot of conspiracy stuff, and I know you might not be able to answer or, you know, you can just remain quiet or whatever. But there's a lot of people talking that this came from a lab in China. How true is that? Should we be really concerned? Uh, or, or, or what comments could you say? Well, biological weapons have been outlawed for a long time. And yet, genetically modifying viruses to create new effects with them has been state-sponsored by multiple states, including the US, for quite some time. So it's a blurry line as to when is it medical research and when is it biological weapon? Yeah. A biological weapon. But if you were walking down the street and someone showed you a six foot banana and all other fruit is six inches, do you think it's natural? <laughs> so if a virus mutates three million times faster than naturally and it's contagious at like uh, I love 10 or 20 times typical, and more, it, and more deadly. deadly. <laughs> <laughs> so what you're saying is you wouldn't be shocked if it did come from a lab. I'm very rarely shocked. Okay. Okay. All right. I'm going to take out some more life insurance, I guess. And uh, without getting political, because I know, you know, that's not what this show is about. But if you um, could make recommendations to the president on how we could handle solving this problem, what would you recommend? So we've been solving problems rapidly for 30 plus years now. And we're very process oriented. I'm a big checklist process flow kind of person because the way my brain works. So we've kind of come up with a methodology for solving all problems, like a, like a framework for approaching a problem. And if I applied that to this one, the first question is who's in charge? Who's really in charge? And we have no world police that are in charge of everywhere. And the second thing is, are they correct? Are they qualified? Um, so we, we call this politely governance, not government. Uh, mm. Ability, how do you make decisions about things? And I think in this case, we should have governance that includes 
scientists and doctors, medical professionals, people who actually know this stuff. Mm -hmm. They need to be in what we call a retaliation bubble. So they need to be able to tell the truth with no retaliation, no blowback, no political impacts. They're not going to mm -hmm. lose their job at a big pharmaceutical company. Except they, have, they have to be safe for five years. No matter what the hell they do or say, they're just encouraged to tell the truth. Mm -hmm. Then we need an absolute source of truth. Everything is a conspiracy theory. If I, you know, a, vir a viral video, uh, something that CNN said one day and then the next day said, sorry, scratch that, that was fake. Nobody knows what the hell to believe. Yeah. Now in math, 32 is a statistically relevant number. If I can do something 32 times in a row, it's unlikely to be different the 33rd time. Hmm. We have thousands, thousands, and thousands of people affected by this virus. Why do we have no statistically relevant information? Why can't we say, look, we tried this drug on 3,000 people in a controlled environment at this hospital. We've tracked them for 30 days afterwards, and here's what happened. Rather than this person did this with his friend, and this person did this with 30 people, but we're not really sure, and then blah, blah, blah. And I mean, the questions are finite. They're not infinite. Like, how contagious is it? If you have it and no symptoms, are you contagious? If you've had it, and afterwards you've been um, cured of it, so you had the symptoms, symptoms have gone away, but you're still failing the test, so it's in your DNA, mm. can you give it to other people? Mm -hmm. How many strains are there? And if you are have built up immunity to it, is there a second or third strain you can still catch? Um, those kind of questions, because ultimately, there's for everything we look at is a greater good argument. So we do the math on exactly how much pain, suffering, and death is the virus causing, and then exactly how much pain, suffering, and death is the quarantine causing? Mm -hmm. 16 million people out of work. The stock market on March 20th bounced back to where we were on December 2016. We reached that back to 19,000 in the Dow. Um, we may not recover for that for 10 years. Yeah. Um, there's suicide rates. There's something like 86,000 domestic abuse cases I, I, I saw somewhere. Um, like there's massive effects of being in quarantine as well. So like which one is worse? Now we would then take a, we're like, okay, now we have qualified people in charge without retaliation, with a source of truth where if we publish anything, there needs to be at least the rule of 32 science behind it. It's not a rumor our buddy told us in a bar. Yeah, so I will tell you like, uh, like the New England Journal of Medicine and these publications, I mean, they are just churning out articles after articles after articles without anyone really peer reviewing or looking at it or, yeah, we're flying by the sea of our pants through fear. Yeah, and look, look at, whether you look at cancer or HIV research or anything else, it's all corrupted by who grants money for what. Absolutely. There's 637 different things that are called cancer because if you call it something else, you won't get funding for it. No wonder, <laughs> we, no wonder we can't cure it. <laughs> um, now, the other, the other thing is, if you have that valid state of truth, now you can take an engineering approach and no, no disrespect to the medical community, but they're generally taught to research stuff rather than deliver stuff. As an engineer, I got to ship stuff every Friday. It's a mm -hmm. different attitude than let's just look into this and see how it goes and research and observe. Mm -hmm. So you put engineers in charge of doctors going, are you done yet? Are you done yet? Are you done yet? And why not? <laughs> it's an amazing effect because you can push through stuff much quicker. So for example, we, we have you know, with two trillion in funding that disappeared awfully quickly, that would have paid for groceries for two and a half years for 210 million adults in the US, which is all of them over 21 or over 18. Um, if we analyze the blood from those that have recovered or become immune from it, we may be able to develop antibodies based on that. There's an algorithm in San Diego where in three hours they can come up with a solution, but uh, for the vaccine, but it'll take a year and a half to two years to get it out there. You test it and you go through it. Take a year and a half or two years to do <laughs> trials and testing. The rest of it is paperwork for malpractice for the insurance companies yep. and FDA uh, bureaucracy. Drop everything except the essentials if we're at war. Mm -hmm. Get the clinical trials rapidly on a statistically relevant number of people and not prove that it doesn't harm anyone. Prove that it kills less than 5%. Mm -hmm. <laughs> less than the virus kills. If we're being ruthless about the greater good, right? Okay. Are, we, are we trying to save lives or wait for perfection to be the enemy of the good? Right. If we're letting people back to work and ending quarantine, well, then why not do it in decades? 
let everyone under 25 go back to work for a couple of weeks and see what happens. Everyone under 35, see what happens. Let so everyone under sick or most high risk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you hit 55 and everyone suddenly it's spiking again, then, then right. only people over 45 can go to work. <laughs> a while. At, at least then you can control it that way. Um, because statistically, I think, again, you can correct me on any of these math if I'm wrong on anything, but statistically, it still seems that uh, it's people under 30 are, are generally far less affected than people over 30. Yeah. You have a few outlying cases of young teenagers and stuff that are harmed, but for the most part, it's, yeah. It's in the one or above. Or above. Yeah. Um, then on top of that, sensible things like why not go to restaurants, but have everyone sit at tables one table apart. So the people see seating them at a restaurant, all restaurants can open to half capacity. They just have to seat everyone one table apart. And it's equitable, can you? If you uh, at fifty percent capacity. Say again, what? Restaurants really can't be profitable or stay in business if um, if you're only serving at fifty percent capacity. I think they can on average because most restaurants are not full all the time. They're full on a Friday and Saturday night, but not the rest of the week. Mm -hmm. So maybe you have to open on a Sunday and a Monday. Yeah. And more people want to eat out, want to get it. You'll have a huge surge after quarantine of people who don't want to eat at home because they're sick of it. Sick of the cooking. You have a large amount of people with the domestic abuse cases, couples that have broke up, people who were cheating and got caught. And in New York, you have people who were cheating, got caught, quarantined together, went through divorce, got divorced, and still have to live together because you can't shop for <laughs> right now. That's a little awkward. Um, <laughs> Awkward. <laughs> yeah, so they definitely want to get out. Um, but yeah, the bigger worry for me is not the virus, actually. It's, I wrote a report on this six months ago. Every indicator out there is that we were due for a massive recession and reset in the market anyway at the end of this year. We were, yeah. It just throws fuel on the fire for that. And, you know, when everyone can't pay the rent for three months and then they can't pay it after that and then the commercial businesses go bankrupt and then the landowners who are leveraged up to the eyeballs can't pay their mortgages, this isn't like 2000 or 2007 where one's dot com and one's mortgage. This is everything plus a virus, plus printing our own cash, plus ticking off every other superpower that's no longer being a consumer of our stuff. It's like, you know, perfect, perfect storm multiplied by perfect storm squared. Um, so yeah, the virus is a bit of a trigger here, but the recession that we have afterwards is not going to be a quick four year bounce back. And if you tie in machine learning, AI and automation at the same time in an environment where employers can't lay off half their employees, even if, even if they wanted to for legal reasons, and now mm -hmm. they have, they're automating like crazy so that they don't have to hire half of them back. Mm. Self-driving Ubers, think about it. You don't need valets, car washes, car stations, smog centers, O'Reilly's, Pet Boys. You don't need... I'm going to stop you there because you're getting a little bit off track. What you said was really, really powerful, right? So 22 million people have filed for unemployment, which is basically the number of jobs that were created for the last decade. And what you just said, if I heard you right was that during this time period, businesses have looked at their business structures, tried to figure out what they could automate, send to AI. And you think that about half of those jobs are gone for good? Half of them are gone for good, not just because businesses are looking at what they can automate, it's timing as well. If you, we have 1.6 million truck drivers. Tesla has a self-driving truck. We have yeah. 300,000 300, um, people doing Uber driving because they quit their other gig jobs. We have self-driving Ubers. Uber partnered with Volvo. It's legal in three states, and they've been testing in Pittsburgh for two years. What? So when they kick that on, if you look at real estate then, commercial real estate fly over any major city. Half the land is zoned for parking. You never park an Uber ever. Mm -hmm. and if you get Uber around with targeted advertising because Uber now has your credit card info. They know where you work, where you go, where you sleep, and who you have lunch with because they Uber there as well. And they correlate that data owned by the Chinese because they partnered with Volvo, it's owned by the Chinese. Then they can do targeted Netflix advertising in the back. Oh, owned by the Chinese? Yep. So that's where the self driving Ubers would come from. So if you if you put all that math together, you don't need parking lots anymore. Right. So that crashes real estate because you have twice as much available. 
Um, then you put cheap prefab housing there for everyone who lost their job, and that crashes residential real estate. Yeah. Then you take, when Amazon bought Whole Foods, they had proximity scanners, so you don't need checkouts. Well, there's 1.6 million people who work as checkout counter people. Yeah. We got 6 million in the military, direct and indirect, but we've had unmanned vehicles, unmanned submarines, unmanned aircraft for 15 Drone. years. Drones. We're not putting 20,000 boots on the ground in France ever again. So why do we need all the people if we've unmanned everything? Hmm. So, and we're 20 trillion in debt. So am I the only one seeing all this? <laughs> there is no economic justification as to why we're still standing, period. So it's not just the virus. It's all of that was kicking in anyway. You must be a lot of fun at parties. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the demotivational speaker. Um, demotivational um, speaker. Um, well, I'm always fun at parties four years later when they go, yeah, you were right. <laughs> I want to remind you a little bit again because you went really fast. When we met the very first time, you, you were just talking about um, self-driving cars. And I said, um, what you're saying is it's a lot like you pull the string on the sweater and the sweater comes apart. Can you break that down a little bit slower for the audience? Just, cut, just Not to scare them, but I want them to wake up about the realities that's coming coming down the road that's, like you said, already here. Yeah, don't be scared. Be prepared for it. Take advantage of it. Be prepared. So yeah. self-driving cars. Now people aren't going to own cars. Go ahead. Yeah. So look at our, look at our industry. If cars are self-driving, electrically operated, and cost like two dollars because they're sponsored by advertising or are free and they're like the buses you know they go to the uber central downtown uh, uber metro and they clean them and fuel them or uh, recharge them overnight etc well then you know your garages smog centers inspection centers insurance people farm insurance agents selling car insurance car washes valets parking lots all of that goes away um because people so, aren't going to be having cars, aren't owning cars anymore. Right. If students can travel around for two bucks or for you know two grand a year, they're not going to spend eighteen grand on a Prius, mm -hmm. uh, plus the parking. Um, so that gets rid of the car dealerships. Mm -hmm. Now, if all the cars are self-driving on the uh, and coordinating with each other, driving a meter apart on the freeway. Three years later, they will stop humans being allowed to drive in the freeway or at minimum confine us to the carpool lane only. Mm. And it's kind of like people talk about, well, we had the industrial revolution and people are still have jobs and are busy. I'm like, yeah, but the horses don't. <laughs> millions of horses back then too. Now they're just a luxury item that some people can afford to have. Yeah. Well, in this, in the AI revolution, we are the horses. Oh, shit. Say that again. In the AI revolution, we are the horses now. Unless you happen to get a degree in AI. So what? <laughs> or you're a surgeon. So what's going to happen to uh, to to us then? Like, what's we're going to just be put out to pasture? We're going to become a bi we're going to become batteries for this artificial intelligence, like the Matrix? What? <laughs> that just depends on the qualifications of the leader we all voted for. Because what should happen? is if robots are doing everything then labor cost is low which means production is cheap so if all of our stuff our food can be created farmed trucked shipped packaged and sent to us by machines it should be 10 times cheaper yeah and if we weren't paying 400 billion a year for military then some of that money could be used for the government to pay you taxes instead of them for being a citizen, instead of you paying them taxes, what they yeah. call it, yeah, universal basic income, That's where funny. everyone would be given, you know, 20, 30 grand a year in an economy where everything's 10 times cheaper, so it's equivalent to 300 grand a year, to mm. live. Now, if you want to be an entrepreneur, bust your ass, invent new things, be creative, do entertainment, do medical work, for example, it'll be a long time before robots will be doing that alone, yeah. in more analog jobs, then, yeah, then you get to follow your vocation because you're not worried about paying the rent on Friday. You know, that mm. kid was working at Starbucks, that wasn't his dream growing up. He's just doing it to pay the rent. So right mm. now we're 99% enslaved anyway with everyone on a hamster's wheel trying to pay the rent and put the kids through college. If you remove that hamster wheel need, 
people will probably sit back and be lazy for about three months <laughs> and, and then get bored and start following wherever the vocation is. And, um, but that's an entire shift in leadership, thought process, financial planning, everything. But there's that, a lot of people in this world that don't want to see this world come to place, right? So like big oil, they got to be fighting this. Yeah, no, well, they can fight it all they want, but as we saw recently, you stopped the demand for oil, and now what is it, less than a dollar a gallon in California? In some parts of California? Five bucks or something like that. It's so crazy. if everyone stops consuming it, it doesn't matter how much they like it or don't like it, it's supply and demand. Mm. Um, I think it was like two thirds of the GDP or something is restaurants, or two, mm. I, I forget exactly what the stat was, but 485 billion in restaurant income and we just stopped that dead, um, that, that's going to impact us badly. And um, yeah, so I, look, this stuff is coming not in the next 50 years, but in the next five. Seriously, was, that's my next question, which if, if we've got self-driving cars now, we've got <clears throat> testing in, in three states, et cetera, how long until you see radical change like this happen in under five years? Yeah, I mean, it, it wasn't that long ago we didn't have Uber, and now where did all the taxis go? They're right? gone. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So like, it it doesn't take long for things to disappear. Um, I have a great uh, little analogy on this. So let me try and pull up my phone about understanding exponential versus linear thinking. I actually found it here. So we um, we think linearly. We think we think the future is like this. But yeah. it's exponential. And the best way to understand that is this little thing from Time Magazine. Uh, from an agricultural revolution to industrial took us 8,000 years. From industrial to light bulb took 120. From the light bulb to the moon took us 90. From the moon to creating the web took us 22. From the web, yeah. sequencing our own DNA took us nine years. So things yeah. we think take 100 years now will take five years, two years, six months because it can accelerate and distribute so fast. So Moore's law, which is the, what, the double computing time speed, six months, is that changing too? Moore's law hit, it was a great law that basically said that computers will get twice as fast and half the cost. It was every 18 months or something like that. And it held true for a long time. Um, that computers kept getting smaller and cheaper. And you're, you know, you'd see yeah. it, you look back at your hard drives or your cell phones, or your laptops, how much lighter and cheaper and quicker and longer battery they were, and they didn't cost more. Um, but they have hit a miniaturization limit now, the kind of laws of physics where you're down to a couple of molecules, you can't make it smaller, and if you pack them any tighter, it just overheats. So right. more laws slowed down a bit. That's why you know we used to hard drives, every time you go to Best Buy, it's like, oh, it's one gig, now it's five gigs, now it's 50 gigs, et cetera, et cetera. And now they've been about, you know, about the same for a while because you get, they, they just can't keep having it in size. There's a limit. Yeah. So, so now that we've scared the shit out of all the viewers, <laughs> thanks for that. <laughs> so what well, can people do to protect themselves or prepare for these changes that are coming in the future? Well, I guess I've been saying for a long time, everyone is in the software business. They just don't realize it. You know, if, if things are open and I open a restaurant and you open a restaurant across the street from me and you are using your mom's recipes to create the most beautiful food ever and I am pretty much know nothing about food and I bring in just kind of frozen food in the back and heating it up, but I manage my Yelp better, my reputation better, my Instagram, social media better, my influencers better, my, my um, Groupons better, I'll put you out of business. Mm-hmm because you're in the software business you just didn't realize it um, you know it's sad but true it's like across the board that the number one singers the number one skincare item number one products it's not because they're better it's just better marketing it's mcdonald's it's the yeah. mcdonald's versus reaching more people yeah. and um so if you have been avoiding understanding technology and social media and being online and being plugged into everything and being on top of your messages and having a massive network of people and understanding how things connect and flow and e-commerce, really understanding e-commerce well and how it's changing and for younger people building your TikTok following and using that to migrate 
people into your Instagram and then flowing that into your Shopify account to do conversion and looking at your stats. If all of that sounds like boring geek work to you, then you will be unemployed. Mm. Um, there's not a whole lot left. What if someone says they're too old, like they're 60? Yeah, I'd say read a book because there's lots of entrepreneurs that have been very, very successful and changed their life. You're never too old to evolve. It's mm -hmm. just a matter of evolving. It's not, there's no, nothing physical about thinking and typing. It's just emotional fear of the unknown. Mm. Um, now, in terms of money, you know, diversify your investments as much as you can is always good advice. But, you know, in this particular case, in the, with the way things are going in the marketplace, it's a case of, you know, things aren't going to bounce back or get better in a month or two. So we know that mm -hmm. um, people need to plan for that. So do you think we're heading to like a major depression, like 1930s, much more than a recession, like the 2008? Yeah, um, the smartest yeah. folks, including uh, Ray Dalio did an interview the other day on this, but the I smartest see. investors out there have all said, this is way worse than 2000 or 2008. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the next disaster compared to it would be the, the, the crash, the 1930s crash depression. Um, and depression because we're not suddenly going to get smart enough to switch to universal basic income overnight. What's going to happen is everyone will be greedy. Everyone will fight for survival. Politicians will be politicians. Everyone will line their own pockets and do it, steal the money, steal the grants. It'll just go poof and disappear. Like I said, groceries for a family for a year on average in the U.S. is 550 uh, bucks a year, a year. And we have, or sorry, 550 a month. And we have, so 2,500 and something. And we have uh, enough money to give 6,600 to every every adult in the US if we have 2 trillion and we won't. Some people get 1,200 bucks and we wonder where the rest went. <laughs> and, um, so it's like, it's just doing the math on it. It's like, well, you take the total and divide it by the population. Like, where where'd the, money go? Where'd the rest of it go? Administration? Um, <laughs> No, see, they say it's these big companies that uh, got these huge loans. Well, the other thing is, why give anyone money? Why not just go to Amazon, create a grocery package to keep every family alive, and deliver those for free to the families? Mm -hmm. like, cut the money out of it. Just send people what they want or give them credit to buy groceries mm -hmm. and nothing else. So the money doesn't get pissed away by whoever happened to grab the check. Um, you know, like there's more sensible ways of doing things than we're doing them for sure. And that's, you know, that's kind of our approach to everything. I mean, yes, you're giving me a massive semi impossible problem, but what we do at Scorpion is we take that same approach to your life, to your business, to your lawsuit, et cetera. You, you, call, you call us up and we jump on a call with you uh, once a week at least. And we work with you week to week to go, okay, what is the logical smart way here to separate the facts from the feelings and get you the optimal return on investment to get out of this, either avoiding liability or in making money. How do you make your book a New York Times bestseller or whatever? Do you deal mostly with entrepreneurs and businesses, or can just normal people call you up, concierge.com? Yeah, it's typically um, people, individuals, mm. but they're often entrepreneurial, which is why they have stuff going on. Now, we've had individuals who you know inherited something from their father, big factory or something they don't know what to do with it they're 21 years old he passed away and everyone's trying to sue them or rip them off so they want protection we've had people buy land that they got kind of swindled into where the land is marked for conservation so they can't build a house on it so we figure out how you can build a house on it legally mm -hmm. uh, we um, have had individuals where like their kids are sick and Cedar sinai in Boston have spent 10 years trying to figure out what's wrong with them and why they have a low white blood cell count. And mm -hmm. we do it in six months. Um, and it's just because we take this all, all out attitude of let's just assume nothing, question everything, reach out to all the experts, mash together what they say and treat it like an engineering project where I have to deliver a result on Friday. Wow. And take a, just a no BS approach to problem solving. What really sucks is you, like you're just like me, you can't run for president. I'd say Walter O'Brien for president, but you can't run. You're not you're, you're not a native citizen. Um, true. Although friends of mine came up with solutions to that. <laughs> they're, they're not sure they check so much if you're vice president. Anyway, uh, <laughs> but more realistically, um, 
you can be popular or you can be right. Mm-hmm. And we are a democracy. So someone who tells the truth like me would never get votes. Mm-hmm. I get them, but not in critical mass. Mm-hmm. They want the high EQ, kiss the baby, tell you what you want to hear type approach. And that's what makes people feel good. And they vote because of name recognition and they feel good. It's not a strategic decision. Mm-hmm. The trouble is, what's going to happen coming up is the results of that not being a strategic decision. Hmm. So there's no way that you know of to avoid this economic crash. And follow-up question would be, did we do the right thing by shutting down the global economy? Shutting it down as an educational tool for people to understand how serious it is Mm -hmm. for, you know, whatever a month. So people know it and feel it and understand how bad it could be. And then opening it up in a sensible controlled manner. Like I mentioned, Mm -hmm. makes sense to me, shutting it down indefinitely with no plan and no scientist in charge. No, that's never good. (laughs) I mean, it's better than, I guess, just not talking about it and just letting it kill people. But, there has to be some kind of measured approach and some with, based on facts behind this. And um, hopefully we'll get to some version of that soon. But mm. it, uh, so, yes, I think it was a good idea to shut it down because we got everyone's attention. Mm-hmm. But now what? You can't just stay shut down until 2022 when vaccines get distributed. Um, you say no solution to it. I think if we took the radical approach of calculating the greater good, and removing absolutely every inch of red tape from getting the vaccine out. And uh, if the Supreme Court of California made a uh, Supreme Court of the US made a, a ruling saying nobody can sue anyone or their employer for getting coronavirus, mm-hmm. they removed all the legal bullshit of what if I hire my employees back and one of them comes to the office and gets the other sick. Um, is everyone going to sue me for giving them coronavirus now? Like that's what employers are thinking. They're like, well, what the fuck? I don't know if this is. Yeah. Safe or not. So if you remove all the bullshit, then we can very much get things done in maybe 60 or 90 days. Mm-hmm. But they won't. We were we were due for a crash, like you say, economic reset. Um, but the things that we used to get us out of 2008, printing more money, dropping interest rates. I mean, interest rates are already zero. Uh, we just trin- printed two trillion dollars. How are we going to get ourselves out of this? We're not. I mean, <laughs> we're, we're going to go through a ten-year bloodbath, riots in the streets. When you know, two out of one out of two families can't feed their kids. What we call this lovely, sophisticated, civilized society—the fabric that keeps them civilized—will go away real fast. Just look what happens when they run out of toilet paper. Mm-hmm. Um, and it'll only be through brute force that we go through this horrible long time of, go, of being forced to the conclusion that I mentioned at the beginning, which is, okay, we got to restructure to have universal basic income. Hmm. You can't stop evolution. If we stop using robots to produce everything, every other country will kick our butt in hmm. pricing. Uh, China's learning to consume their own products just to not have a big dependency on us and own half the infrastructure in India now. So. They're already planning for this. They can see the writing on the wall. Um, and you know, our next generation has been focused on worshiping, you know, rap stars and reality show stars and taking selfies. So we don't have a hardcore qualified group of programmers and scientists who respect math. We didn't foster that culture. We made fun of those people. Mm-hmm. And they all went back to India. <laughs> Oh, hopefully they'll hire us and outsource their work to us at minimum. So, do you see instead of us coming together, becoming one unified world, we're going to go back to our little, you know, states and and stay separate and isolated and all that stuff like back in World War One era? Yeah, I can see very much that. Um, you know, people, most of the U.S. haven't traveled, don't have passports, haven't been exposed to the country, so anything outside their walls must be barbarians. Yeah. Uh, Anyone who's traveled knows there's you know there's good people from every country in every area and there's bad people too. 
Absolutely. You can't have one unified world if no one's in charge. We have people fighting over whichever bit of dirt they happen to be born on because they think that's special. So yeah. you have the, the king of this piece of dirt and the king of that mm -hmm. island and the king of this here, and none of them want to give up their kingdoms. And nobody's in charge. Nobody's in charge of the planet. Nobody's in charge of global warming. Nobody's in charge of humanity. Nobody's in charge of where we're going. We have people fighting over little bits of dirt to see how much taxes they can get. That's all we got. A loose amalgamation of warring factions. Hmm. Otherwise, the UN would have been more effective. Wow. Oh, wow. Okay. Can I... <laughs> Can I ask you some your thoughts on a couple of conspiracies and you can either tell me yes, no, pass. Can we try to play this game without getting um, you? All right, we can try. We can try. Okay. The JFK assassination, inside job or not? Oh, wow, you're going way back. Uh, before my time, I'm afraid. I wasn't involved in that one. <laughs> so can't comment, okay. Um, was the moon landing real? Some people don't think it's real. <laughs> yes, the moon landing was real. They released like 26,000 photos of it. If I said I went on vacation in Cabo last year and I had like 300 photos of me in Cabo, I was like, yeah, okay, it's real. I was there. Okay. How do you explain flat earthers? Like, is the earth flat? <laughs> if the earth wasn't flat, then why is it curved when we have an eclipse? Ooh, that's pretty nice. That's pretty nice. Okay. Um, <laughs> I had some other good oh, ones. My, my, my favorite tweet is online when someone was questioning the Flat Earth Society. Yeah. And uh, to see the, the leader of it responded with, we, we have membership from all around the globe. <laughs> <laughs> okay. How about um, Area 51? Do we really have aliens on Earth? <laughs> You're taking too long to answer. <laughs> I would put it this way. Look, every photo we have an alien is some black and white blurry thing from a guy in an RV with a shitty camera at night. Yeah. We've got high def cameras in, in our pockets for the last two decades and nobody has a good picture of them, the Loch Ness Monster or the um, or the uh, uh, Bigfoot. All the, all the high def photos are uh, uh, missing for some reason. Now, do we have all kinds of experimental aircraft that you wouldn't believe that fly in ways you guys have never heard of? Of course we do. Yeah. yeah, we mess with stuff all the time like that. Do we keep it private because it could be a great weapon in a war that we don't want our enemies to know? Yeah, but that's what every country does. Hmm. Could there be aliens in the universe? It would be a huge ego trip if we thought there wasn't. Yeah, with yeah. billions and billions of stars out there, the Goldilocks theory, meaning we're rotating just close enough to the sun to warm us up but not burn us up, and just far enough away. To, to be able to not evaporate all the water on the planet. So are there other planets that have carbon on it that happen to be just close enough to be warm and just far enough away not to burn up? Yeah, they're out there. Um, now, are those aliens more advanced than us or less advanced than us? Again, if we stick with math and not ego, then if there's billions of stars and we're one of them, it's completely random whether they're a thousand years ahead of us or a thousand years behind us. We don't know. Have they visited us already? And and or just one drunk guy in an RV in Arizona and never came back? <laughs> Highly doubted. I think if they visited us, we'd know, we'd meet them. They'd either keep us as pets or be on the evening news. So we'll know when they get here. So not sure, not sure. Okay. Um, you kind of touched on this, but without keeping people up at night, how close do you think we're, we are to World War III? It depends on how you define World War III. So I think the impact of this virus will be as bad as 9-11 or, or, or World War II in terms of number of deaths. We're talking millions will die, especially look at Brazil, look at India, other places that there's no protection there. Uh, so the, the overall numbers are going to be staggering. Mm -hmm. Now, are two countries going to go to war in the middle of that or because of that? I, I don't think so. Are we going to go to war with each other for looting and rioting? Yeah, probably. Civil war. Wow. Probably. That'll happen economically. So I think other warring with other countries is the least of our worries right now. Mm. No resources here to take. <laughs> and um, so, yeah. Uh, uh, now, if you define World War III as I do, which is the next major cyber attack, mm. 
12 state sponsored people in a room shut down everything from your smart grid to your rail crossings to your sewage systems hmm. to an EMP device going through major cities on a in a in an oil barrel in the back of a train truck you know smart attacks like that that's coming that's coming hmm. terrorist attacks and ransom requests based on biological warfare terror from terrorists because they always do copycat stuff so we we just spent billions educating the public on how scary a virus is they will capitalize on that they're mm -hmm. already always crime that was <coughs> the, smart, the smart thing for them to do so they're already working on it um that kind of stuff will happen but and, and all that war where you know china and the us or go at each other it's like why bother at this point Hmm, because we have other ways to kill each other, huh? So instead of um, asking you about coronavirus and 5G, can I just ask you, what's the big deal about 5G? Why is everyone so up in arms about it? Well, in general, you know, my feeling on it is I, I just looked at the measurements of an independent test group plus the FCC to see how much radiation there actually is. And I also went back to actually how much radiation affects the body that you get. And what happens is the person who measures it, like let's say you were assigned to measure what is the limit for how much radiation a body can handle. You're going to err on the safe side. You're going to measure whatever the limit is, and you're probably going to half it or knock it down 10 times. And then you'll hand that to the recommendation board, and they'll want to pay it safe, and they'll knock it down 10 times. And then they, the, the, the lawyers will knock it down 10 times and say, there's a new limit. Well, 5G is 0.03% of that limit. Mm. <laughs> And the interesting thing is when you talk about anyone who's complaining about 5G or burning down the towers or all of that, and you ask them, well, what is the radiation level versus what is the safe limit for humans? Nobody's looked into it. Nobody's actually read it. So I actually read it and went, okay, it's not a thing. It just, I just have faster internet. So. But isn't it also get into privacy? Like they're going to recognize you wherever you go, face recognition, all this sort of stuff's tied into 5G. And I'm sorry, I don't understand. What's privacy? <laughs> We haven't had that since the late that was 90s. That funny, Walter. And you, say, and you say you don't have EQ. Look at you. Or I know how to simulate it every five minutes. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. <laughs> um, no, but I mean, seriously, it's like, what, what privacy? If you want to track anything down or find anything out and you have dedicated resource to do it, you can do it. Mm. If I, I mean, for example, your cell phone, people are worried about using cell phones. The government will use cell phones to trace people and track people to know where the virus is and who else they infected. The IP signal of the records of where you've been based on triangulation of the strength of your signal against the local towers that you connect with as you travel or drive along, that data is not yours. It's mm -hmm. owned actually by the companies <clears throat> often offered publicly. So if I wanted to find out where you were last week, I don't even need a subpoena hmm. to go get it. It's just, information that I can ask the company for. They'll sell it to me if I want to buy it. Hmm. That's an example when I say, what privacy? What are you talking about? You don't even own the data. You don't even have rights to it. All right. I don't know if I want to ask you this question, but last question. You've been very generous with your time. What keeps you up at night? What are you really worried about? Well, I worked on that with the TV show. One of the rule, one of the, the 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 goals driving the show was to try and make intelligence cool for kids. Mm. That being intelligent is cool. That you can be a superhero by being an Einstein or being an Elon Musk, and do cool stuff. And we don't do that. We don't worship that at all. Mm. You know, if if Bill Gates has a speech or a conference in the U.S., they don't need to block off three square blocks around it for security to stop people screaming trying to get in but they do with beavers in town right we're worshiping the wrong thing now they do need three three square blocks of, of security if gates speaks in china or warren buffett or anyone else mm -hmm. to try and get to that person so they're seeking a source of wisdom a source mm -hmm. of intelligence just learn one little epiphany one little piece of information that could change your life over here we don't Mm. We don't chase it. We don't respect it. We don't use it. We don't teach it. And that's the root cause of everything. Whether it's your leadership, who's voting for them, how we counsel ourselves, uh, how we embrace technology versus trying to fight it. Um, 
religious zealots killing each other. A group of scientists have never gone to war with each other in the history of the world. It's always people with blind faith in something who are scared to be questioned. They're in a book club that consists of reading one book. And um, so as long as you have that level of ignorance across the board, you can't possibly have a healthy society. There's mm -hmm. no rationale. Well, I'm going to tell you, every time I talk to you, I have major epiphanies. So as much as I can talk to you, I try to, man. You've been amazing. Thank you so much. So generous with your time. And I'd just like to take this moment to honor you, Walter. I mean, you're such an inspiration. You've done so much at such a young age um, from military, helping keep us safe, our, our, you know, all your inventions that's making our lives better, all that stuff, uh, you know, finding the Boston bombers, everything you've done has been amazing. You deserve every great thing that's happened to you in your life. And so, um, for the last thing, if anybody wanted to get in touch with you or follow you on social media, what's your social media handle? And do you do that? Is it really you? Is it, is it a robot? Like, <laughs> are you a robot? What? <laughs> I try to keep my social media as private as possible, just uh, in terms of me directly. So going on our website to the press section is, um, there's thousands of articles there. That's the easiest way to see who we are and what we do. And mm -hmm. I significantly new we do we publish it there mm. uh, watching the tv show will teach you how we think and give your kids epiphanies especially if you're over 10 years old watch it with your kids you'll have a great discussion on iq versus eq afterward mm. if you have a serious problem issue concern um and you have more than 10 grand to devote to it go to concierge up type in the problem and we'd be happy to jump on a call and try and help you now as long as you're okay with straight talk and ruth ruthless honesty we're not going to sugarcoat it. And the reason we do that is I've just um, found over the years that the good people love it. They love the no BS approach. It's more efficient. They gravitate towards it. They love having a good debate on it. They learn from it. And the people who are much more about feeling good than doing good will run away from me. And I'm fine with that. It's just an, it's more efficient. Mm. So, um yeah, for those that really care more about their mission than their feelings, then then we'll be on the same page. Concierge.com. Concierge.com. It'll take you to scorpioncomputerservices.com. It just, Concierge Up takes you to a page that shows you examples. We'll scroll across the screen of the kinds of things we help people with. Um, just uh, I've talked about a few on the call, but physical security, cybersecurity, researching, you have some new product idea and you don't even know if it's a good idea or a bad idea. Is it feasible? How much would it cost to do this? We can look into that, kind of like your researchers or the smart kids in high school. We'll do your homework for you and report back to you. Private investigation work, expert witness work um, against personal threats, uh, maturity and scaling, your company starting to grow and you're like, I don't want to lose it to the investors, but I'm also, I'm a startup guy, not a CEO. How do I learn to scale this thing up? Um, your your bug out plans for family. We're moving family members now off to their vacation homes in Aspen, having three months food supply, take, making sure the kids get there safely, giving them backup plans for how to fly out of there if the FAA shut down the air, airlines or, or don't allow people to fly. Mm -hmm. um, understanding what to do. I mean, everyone's panicked right now because they're stuck at home, but wait till the internet goes out, power goes out, government takes over 80% of the bandwidth of cell phones, so you can't use that. The only reason people are calm is they still have internet. They can still do this. Mm -hmm. you, you you go lights out because the infrastructure falls apart. Um, mm -hmm. The people aren't there maintaining it. And then you got a bigger problem. So we secure people's houses, laminated glass. Because you can have all the uh, alarm systems in the world, but if someone just smash your window and walk in and doesn't care because they know the police are busy anyway, then having laminated windows makes your windows smash proof. Uh, teaching people on home defense, whether they're for guns or against guns, whether it's guns, tasers, pepper spray, whatever, but some way to defend themselves and their family. This is what we're preparing people for, the people who are smart enough to reach out. So mm -hmm. you, you can call us with any vague request, like, you know, protect my family, <laughs> step one. Step two, what the hell do I do with my business? Uh, things like that. That's awesome. All right, Mr. Brown. Well, we had over 800 captivated viewers watching live today. And, uh, you know, you're doing an amazing job. Thank you so much for coming on. And I hope you'll come back and join us again some, uh, sometime. 
Well, thank you for the good work you've done, and your 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 video will have saved a lot of lives too by you know, waking people up and understanding how serious and nasty this virus gets. And so, thank you for doing that the right way. And yeah, look, I applaud anyone who's getting out there trying to help more than just themselves. And um, you know, I, I want to help the people who can help the most people. I, I'm less into trying to turn around and rehab people who who are not in a habit of doing that. It's 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 too much of a time sink. Thank you so much for your time. I'm going to wrap you up. Say bye, everybody. Bye, Scorpion. <laughs>